Hello friends, today uh, we will look at Henry James' The Turn of the Screw. Now, Henry James' Turn of the Screw, we, we are not really sure whether this is this novella is a ghost story or a story about madness and hellless nations. But what we do know is it's a story that is that's horrifying. It's a horror story. Secondly, along with being a horror story, it does hold up to the promise that, um, that that the narrator comes up with early in the story that it's going to be really dreadful. It's a dreadful is something that the scares readers even today. More than 120 years after publication, it's a story that really holds our attention and it frightens us and, uh, and, I, and I feel that, I mean, and a content that it wouldn't have frightened us that much if it was just a plain ghost story or it was just a story about hallucination. No. I'm not saying that um, there aren't, you know, supporters of either kind. Now, quickly, the story uh, is this. The turn of the screw, as the title suggests, is how to, is to making a situation that's already bad worse. That's what turn of the screw means. That's how the, the introductory chapter actually speaks about how a situation the a ghost story that that they are basically relating to one another and and Douglas comes up with this idea that how can we actually make a situation worse is there a possibility can can you come up with one in one more turn of the screw that's what uh, that's how the title comes from as uh, the author or the the other narrator in the story immediately picks from what Douglas is saying and says that this is the title that I would like to actually give to this book we have to assume that this narrator uh, that Douglas is speaking to, as well as the other guests, is probably Henry James. Um, this unnamed narrator uh, then decides on this particular title. That's how the novel comes about. But the story, in brief, is about a governess who is in charge of two young children, Miles and Flora. Miles, a 10-year-old boy who has been sent away from school, we are not told what exactly is the reason for most part of the book as to what what are the crimes that had committed or what exact what misdemeanor even then i mean james keep it slightly ambiguous as to what it could have been though uh, critics have tried to read into what my into miles various statements saying that what what this could have been but miles had been sent away from school uh, banished from school and he along with his younger sister who is eight year old flora uh, are left in charge of this governess in this huge lonely house along with the housekeeper. Now the governess soon finds that there are a couple of strangers who are roaming around uh, on the estate um, and she finds out that these strangers are only visible to her and not others and she figures out they are ghosts and she goes on to ask, um, ask about who this could be by describing them and finds out that they are Jessel, Mrs. Miss Jessel and Peter Quint, two former employees, one a former governess and the other person who had fallen in love with her and had been banished. Both of them had uh, died rather mysteriously, one committing suicide and the other falling over eyes. Now, these um, these two figures, these two body uh, persons that the governess keeps seeing, uh, she believes that they are in cahoots with the children for most part of the story she thinks that they are somehow training the children corrupting the children and secondly she also believes that even prior to um, their death they had actually corrupted the children in some way james does not exactly tell us how this corruption had happened again uh, we keep assuming that it might be child abuse it might be um, that Miles and Flora had been uh, corrupted in um, by <coughs> with with carnal knowledge as Peter Quint and Jessel had done. Now, uh, if this is these are all assumptions, James never actually tells us what exactly or what kind of corruption this might have been, and the governess keeps assuming various things. Now, at the end of the story. Um, Towards the end of the novella, one, one thing that happens is uh, Flora is uh, when is traumatized by the governess asking her whether she had seen the ghost and what she was doing with the ghost when she has found us to a lake and, and Flora is finally sent away from this place for, because for her health. Uh, Miles, on the other hand, uh, 
apparently says that he had seen the ghost, he apparently seen Peter Quint and the governess in the process of rescuing him from Quint finds out that Miles had passed away, Miles had died. That's, that's the story that we have here. Now, read like this, I mean this kind of summary, one of the things that you would immediately assume is what's so uh, frightening about it because it's a plain ghost story. And remember, this is a ghost story that falls into this tradition of ghost stories in, in Vector Nera, which were hmm, told on Christmas Eve. Again, this is a story that's told, narrated on Christmas Eve. Uh, we'll come back to the Christmas Eve part later. But for the moment, if we are saying that this is a ghost story and there are serious advocates uh, for this, such as Truman Capote and Brad Lithuza, who keep suggesting that this is, insisting that this is a ghost story, that we have to accept the governor's, governor's word as to whether what she had seen and this is the ghost that when it finally had taken possession of Miles' body and the ghost when it leaves Miles, there is a kind of exorcism that had happened towards the end of the story which had resulted in Miles' death. This is an inference that is strong. James never tells us in so many words. Now, if it is a ghost story, <coughs> if it's a ghost story, this is a ghost story that would fall in, in, in a set, follow the same pattern of Victorian ghost stories which had children. One story that immediately comes to mind is Emma James' Lost Hearts, which speaks about these two children who had been sacrificed for a reason and how they come back to haunt, come back to actually wreak vengeance. That's, that's what Emma James' short story does. However, in contrast to what Emma James does or, uh, or in Ga Elizabeth Gaskell's um, The Nurse's Story, what we see in the turn of the screw is the, the, under the significance or, or our understanding of whether some, uh, we have a ghost in the story or not is completely dependent on whether we believe the governess or not. Now, the story when it is told and it's a story that is told as a framed narrative and the framing narrative where we have an author who is basically come bringing us the story as it is told to him by Douglas who is reading from a manuscript of the governess and these are incidents that have happened to the governess we don't know exactly what um, whether to believe them or not but remember this framing narrative technique that uh, James uses here is <coughs> quite similar to the kind of framing technique that we would find in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and later in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. How, now, while uh, we look at the framing techniques in Heart of Darkness and Fra Frankenstein and we say that this narrative in one sense distances the reader from the uh, from the actual narrative or from the incidents that have happened and the person who is the real protagonist of the story, they also in one sense seem as if the narrator keeps collaborating in one sense, keeps mm, um, reiterating what, uh, what has been told to them. So that Walton, for instance, reiterates what, uh, what had been told to him and by doing so in Frankenstein makes the reader uh, have two sources from whom whom he is asked to believe. This particular story, on the other hand, we have a framing narrative which is like most ghost stories in reality, in real life, where uh, the, the presence or absence of a ghost or the sighting of a ghost is something that's always done second hand. In the sense, people keep talking about how uh, their uh, friends have seen ghosts, their relatives have seen the ghosts, their parents or grandparents or uncles or someone had seen ghosts rather than they themselves had seen ghosts and this um, becomes significant because ghost stories then act on the basis that uh, we are not never coming across, we are never really meeting the protagonist who had experienced a ghost but rather we are viewing ghosts through someone else's eyes. Now this means that we have to trust more than one narrator. The authenticity or the veracity of not just one narrator but more than one narrator is brought under the scanner in this particular version because we are questioning not just um, the uh, not just 
the author but also Douglas and also along with the Douglas we are also asking question in the governors this this becomes problematic for the reader because we do not know what happens to what we consider as absolute truth is it the truth that is being uh, that we get after so much filtering that has been happening or so many persons who are relating this story now the other problem that we have with this um, uh, idea of of whether it's a ghost or a hallucination is because right at the very beginning when the governor's man we start reading the governor's manuscript there are references to a couple of tales one the mysteries of Udolpho and Radcliffe's mysteries of Udolpho that she refers to and the other one is a reference to Jane Eyre uh, where she talks about the married woman in the attic now both these references both these gothic novels that the governess refers to also tells us the kind of literature that the governess is reading and in that sense the governess might have been led to start imagining imagining certain things which she had been reading about she had been reading about these noises in the attic sounds or various happenings that that uh, and radcliffe and uh, charlotte brown describe in their novels and as, they, as she had read them she is trying to seek the, have the same kind of melodrama in her own life and she is mm, she she in that sense starts seeing ghosts or visualizing ghosts or starts hallucinating if she is of a nervous dis disposition remember also that i mean when she is speaking about this ghost when she is speaking about uh, both radcliffe's story and charlotte Brown, what the reader needs to realize is both those novels of course are not horror novels though they do have certain supernatural elements for instance even in jane Eyre, at the end of it you have this miraculous curing that happens which is nothing less than supernatural but uh, which is nothing less than something that's really uncanny but when these things that are included as if they become a part of the logical sane worlds logical empirical world what the authors such as bronte and <coughs> um and radcliffe had done is they are creating a kind of a genre of literature which falls into the uh, which we term as sensation fiction and the sensation fiction pattern the gothic novel sensation fiction pattern that they're falling into does not create certain boundaries which would stop them from using supernatural if it serves their purpose it's not as if these are scientific novels this is not as if these are detect this is these are detective fiction so that they are uh, banned from using something that is really supernatural so that unlike for instance uh, say the sherlock Holmes story hound of baskervilles where uh, Holmes had to show that I mean the hound is not something supernatural or in the other home story that we had dealt with silver blaze um, he he has to describe that the, this murder is not something that's uncanny but it is something that's extremely logical though something that might be slightly improbable here in this particular story James does not tell us whether this story falls into the pattern of gothic fiction ghost stories sensation fiction detective fiction or what it is what he just tells us is it's a horror story it's a story that about something that's truly dreadful and in that sense you have freedom to as the reader has the freedom to actually imagine that something uncanny happened or something improbable happened improbable in the sense that this governess is hallucinating that this governess is mad now <laughs> what uh, james is doing in the novel is his he's actually drawing upon um, certain prior texts which actually deal with something pretty similar whether it is nathaniel hawthorne's house of seven gables or uh, <coughs> or, or even wuthering heights for that matter because the kind of atmosphere the eerie atmosphere that james creates or rather the governess the way the governess describes this place makes the reader believe that this story this uh, the turn of the screw is also about eerie happenings but again you are asking the reader to um, come up with a certain understanding or a certain belief because you are drawing upon a certain cultural code 
as to what uh, what exactly goes into the making of a ghost story or a sup- or supernatural stories now what exactly goes into supernatural stories in the way or a victorian ghost story generally the victorian ghost story is set in these lonely estates just like Henry James novella here it is at a lonely estate you are speaking about chill uh, a person who is a stranger in a strange place again we have this governess who has newly appointed to this place again someone who is stranger who is, who does not know this uh, this this particular particular place that she finds herself in thirdly you are also saying that this is uh, these are stories that um, that would speak about innocence being corrupted at one level whether it is Sheridan Lefanu's Carmilla or others which speak about as a, that kind of innocence being corrupted which become part of your Victorian ghost story tradition and we have two children who are probably corrupted as the governess believes now so you're seeing that there are certain reasons why uh, how the story actually becomes a part of uh, the Victorian ghost story tradition or seems to fall into the same pattern what James does here which is completely different is he does not bring the ghost out into the open now what we mean when we say that he does not bring the ghost out into the open unlike the sensation fiction sensation mel- melodramas of Ian Radcliffe or other he does not unmask it and say that this is not really a ghost but uh, but something that is that that uh, readers as well as the characters had mistaken or, or misled for for a major part that's not what james does on the other hand he also does not do something similar where he speaks about this ghost from a perspective where people realize there is a ghost and there is either the ghost wreaking vengeance or the ghost being exorcised or the ghost finally uh, being exterm- um, exterminated in some sense as happens in uh, Stoker's Dracula. Now, none of these actually happen which are uh, Henry James story though when we say that Quinn finally disappears probably there's an exorcism that is happening there. The problem is this this notion of what um, James does here with with the narrator is as we said is a question that goes back to our understanding of what is faith as we said earlier this is a story set on Christmas Eve and the disturbing part of the story if it, this lady if the governess is someone who is mad is uh, she she actually had murdered Miles she had killed Miles she had become mad enough that she had killed Miles and she had strangled Miles while they uh, she had traumatized the little girl and both these actions of hers, I mean, this madness which is supported by critics such as Edmund Wilson, and they believe that. I mean, this there is there is a easy reason to believe this. Except that we, it then starts making us wonder whether the story, if if viewed from that pattern, is mainly because we do not have ample faith. We do not have faith. Now, what is this faith that we are asking, speaking about? Uh, Faith is not exactly belief. Faith is not based on reason. Just like when I say that I have seen a ghost, for instance, or I, or I, or I have faith in God, for instance. These are statements that you are making which you cannot scientifically prove. None of this. It's not that you are being agnostic or atheist when, when you say that you are... Um, you do not believe in God unless there is ample proof, but though that's what agnosticism would be. But that questioning of proof or the desire for proof is where uh, it comes from a, a desire to have a scientific basis for everything, a scientific explanation for everything. However, the supernatural um, is something that has for a long time been perceived as something that is beyond the realms of reason because it is the supernatural of course but along with it I mean it is beyond the realms of reason to an extent where you come up with uh, not 
not empirical evidence to believe it because for instance in the story we have the governess um, who sees a ghost but this is not something that she can completely come up with empirical evidence because the children as well as the housekeeper everyone keeps refusing kids denying that they have seen anything around them and as they keep denying the empirical evidence that the governess can bring to the table is something that is completely lost it's not as if she can look for people to come up with corroborating evidence saying that this is what i have done i have spoken with a ghost or i have seen a ghost or as and these are the steps that a ghost has taken because this is not something that scientifically can, they can prove unlike um, say the law of gravity for instance which can be proven now if you are saying that this understanding of ghosts has to be taken on the matter of faith the question then is also that remember this is a story that is narrated on christmas eve what happens to the, our own understanding of 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 christmas eve christmas eve is celebrated because you are looking at uh, as a matter of faith of a matter of resurrection of matter of christ being out there to save the world now this if this is a matter of faith for the christians the ghost stories which are narrated on christmas eve as a tradition in victorian era would are also in one sense celebrating this act it as an act of faith in that case the turn of the screw becomes a ghost story however if just because we are assuming that it is told on christmas eve it has to be a ghost story the problem that we have is this narrator also comes across as someone who falls into what you term as the unreliable narrator bit now um the governess is unreliable not just because she's tangential we do have tangential narrators um, as a tradition in literature prior to turn of the screw and after turn of the screw for instance we have what um, in moby dick we have someone such as ishmael who's not the main protagonist or nick in great gatsby who who, no, who are narrators but who are tangential 